the CDC has said that 75 to 90 percent of all visits to primary care doctors are directly related to stress, anxiety, and the ways that people try to cope with them, which largely are, are what I call toxic coping, uh, you know, eating too much, drinking too much, smoking cigarettes, taking other drugs. Part of what we're up against is the uh, culture we have of uh, kind of quick fix and avoidance of feelings. We're all human and we like easy answers. We like a simple answer to a complex problem. If it was a pill you could take and it just reduced your stress and it had no downside or negative side effects, sure, that's a pill I would take and that's, you know, everybody would be lined up for that pill. And they're sold and marketed with that idea. In 1987, when we started down this path, we as a country spent $800 million on psychiatric drugs. Today we're spending $40 billion a year on psychiatric drugs, a 50-fold increase. And what do we see? More problems, not less. I almost died from having been medicated with a anti-anxiety medication called Ativan, also called lorazepam, for four years when my husband was declining with dementia. And then after he died, three doctors kept prescribing biopsychiatric drugs. And then the biopsychiatric drugs became the enemy. I'm honored to have been asked by Marjorie to welcome you to this important meeting on benzodiazepine tranquilizers being held in Bend, uh, Oregon. I took occasional Valium. We're gathered here today focusing on a number of concerns uh, about the use of benzodiazepines, including their dependence producing liability and their interaction with opiates, for instance, that can lead to toxicity. Benzodiazepines and trauma have a sordid connection, um, and that includes uh, a lot of use of benzodiazepines to manage the immediate reactions to trauma that many people have. So anxiety, nightmares, uh, struggles with reactivity can really be suppressed um, with the use of benzodiazepines. The biggest takeaway from this conference, the International Benzodiazepine Symposium, is how impressed I was about the depth and severity of reactions that some individuals, not all, but some individuals can experience during the use of benzodiazepines and after discontinuation or during that tapering process. I couldn't sleep, obviously, but I, I developed all these other new weird symptoms too. I couldn't read. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't walk around the block because it was too painful. There's a lot of adverse effects, even over the short term. Amnesia can be a problem, psychomotor retardation. Of course, there's some emotional dis diminishment as well. This went on for about a period of four months, and during that time, I actually became somewhat suicidal for the first time in my life. Patients get invalidated by their doctors so often, especially psychiatric patients. One of the problems is people think psychiatric patients are unreliable witnesses to their own lives. It's ridiculous, of course, but they do get discounted. I was told that I had postpartum because my baby was still fairly young, but I really didn't believe that was the case. I've, I've been through extreme situations before in my life, and I know what depression is, and this was not that. There was something wrong with me physically. Largely, the patients just don't know that problems that they're having are due to the benzos that they're on. I mean, they may feel like they have Alzheimer's disease. I've had patients come in and say, I must have Alzheimer's because I can't remember anything. And I said, well, that's your Xanax, that's your Ativan, that's your uh, Klonopin that you've been on forever. Like all drugs, when they're not used in the right way, then they lead to problems. Brief use, you know, I think it can be okay for somebody to use some Xanax before they get on a plane if that's the only time they need it. Um, it's actually pretty great for that purpose. 
the problems come up when you use it consistently and over a significant period of time. I would come home some evenings really late at 7, 7.30 and kids were laying on the ground, sometimes crying, sometimes weren't, and I look around to see where Jocelyn was and she'd just be laying on the floor. And I'm like, honey, are you okay? And she can verbally talk to me sometimes. She was just like, I'm just really dizzy, not feeling well and I just didn't know what was going on. What they need to know is that there's going to be a withdrawal period that can be very difficult. And long-term outcomes uh, with continual benzodiazepine usage are terrible. So then the psychiatrist said that just to keep going, that they would kick in, and they would kick in, and finally I collapsed in my apartment, and I knew I was in big trouble. I think of how drugs work in a very molecular sort of way. Whether it's opioids interacting with their receptors or benzodiazepines interacting with their receptors, the basic pharmacology is pretty much the same. In 2008, I had sudden onset of a very violent tinnitus in one ear and uh, it was like a tractor in my head and um, I couldn't sleep. I went to see my ear, nose and throat surgeon. He said it was uh, essentially a, a symptom of my Meniere's disease and he had always prescribed uh, Valium for me as a preventative. I'd never taken it, but in this case uh, I started to take it because uh, I couldn't sleep. Really, drugs are a way of communicating with the body using its same language. And the words of the language the body uses are chemicals. Drugs are chemicals. And the better that the words of the drugs match the words of the body, the more you get good communication without miscommunication. So in my view, therapeutic effects of drugs are using the precise words and adverse effects are using words that are not as precise as they should be. I started to have all kinds of paradoxical symptoms. I had very um, serious uh, sound sensitivity. People talking to me had booming voices and then this would alternate as if I was hearing people uh, drowning um, underwater. But after six to eight weeks uh, I started getting these uh, terrible stabbing pains in my legs and uh, I knew that this couldn't possibly have anything to do with Meniere's disease and I went to the web and I discovered to my absolute horror the Ashton Manual which is about benzodiazepines and uh, what they do and what uh, withdrawal symptoms they can cause and I discovered I was suffering from withdrawal symptoms with these shooting pains in my legs while taking the drug. Doctors think about benzos as a safe approach for both anxiety management and insomnia management. There's some simple-minded thinking about, oh, anxiety, well, let's give, let's give a benzo, that's good for anxiety. Oh, somebody can't sleep, we'll give a, a benzo, that'll get them to sleep. And the fact is that it, it does produce satisfied patients in the short term. And so you can't really expect the patients to self-censor. It's really the provider's job to say, this could work for you for a little while, but then it's going to come back to bite you and you'll be sorry. The big current epidemic now is, is withdrawal from opioids and addiction to opioids, overdoses and deaths from opioids. Um, and people with opioid withdrawal feel like, oh my God, I'm so uncomfortable. And people make a big deal about opioid withdrawal, but benzo withdrawal is actually a much more serious condition. People don't die from opioid withdrawal, but they can die from benzo withdrawal. People don't get delirious from opioid withdrawal, but you can get delirium, which is acute brain failure from alcohol and sedative withdrawal, including benzos. When I woke up in the morning after sleeping maybe fitfully two hours uh, with sheer exhaustion, um, this cloak of pain took over my body uh, within 15 to 30 seconds of, of waking up and uh, it was getting more aggressive all the time. I couldn't see any end and I made preparations just in case the symptoms overwhelmed me and I'd have to kill myself. We need alternatives. It's not as if we can say, well, you know, we want to stop treating the conditions for which the benzodiazepines are being used. It's can we go that next step on the trajectory?
I see benzodiazepines as sort of one, uh, one issue in a much larger issue, and that is sort of the prescribing of symptom management chemicals that are really designed to help people either not feel or, or handle their feelings. We haven't been taught very well what stress is, not only how to manage it, but how not to create unnecessary stress for yourself. I mean, we're never going to escape stress. Life is stressful. It's protective to us. So anxiety is a normal state and shouldn't be totally eliminated. It's like the pain area. You, you don't want to totally eliminate the sensation of pain. So it's tricky. You want to modulate it, but not totally eliminate it. Eliminating it would be easy. And in a worry solution, I don't tell people not to worry. What I teach them is what worry is. The good parts of worry, which are solving problems. Worry is a way of solving problems and being creative and kind of turning a problem over and over until you find a, a way to solve it. We don't want to hurt and we don't want to feel and we don't want to remember. So taking benzodiazepines and other kinds of suppressant um, medications can take the edge off and physicians often uh, support that as well. In terms of insomnia, there, there's two issues. One is which medicine to use, but probably a more important issue is when to use any medicine. Anxiety and insomnia are also well treated by non-medication techniques. There's uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is probably the most evidence-based treatment for insomnia. There are a lot of there's CBT for anxiety, there's exposure therapies, and all that stuff doesn't work in the presence of benzos. So you have to decide ahead of time that you're not gonna do the benzos, you're gonna do these other treatments. And the nice thing about the other treatments is they give someone skills that they can use the next time they have trouble. They have actually learned something, whereas taking the benzo doesn't teach you anything and keeps you from learning new things just by the nature of the drug. What is particularly important, I think, for medical providers is that they provide informed consent to the patient. But that also means they need to know what the risks, benefits, alternatives, and how to use the medication are. So much of the information about psychiatric drugs that is presented to the public is just out of sync with the actual data from scientific trials. So often the data from the trials, adverse events, deaths, for example, in psychiatric trials, that would be reported to the FDA weren't getting reported in the scientific literature and they weren't getting reported to the public at all. When we talk about misinformation in society, it's not just to the patients, it often is to the medical community itself. I'd found one person, one doctor in Ireland who knew precisely what I was going through and in my documentary he describes benzodiazepine withdrawal as a condition where your body becomes your own personal torture chamber. It turns out in the, cases of the, in the case of the benzodiazepines, they've really been sold to physician under false pretenses. The data was selectively chosen, the data was falsified. I think it would be great to have more safe benzo prescribing courses that physicians could sign up for. These are people who have been brought into a system that was ignorant, and then when ignorance was followed by information. That's when greed took over. Psychiatry has changed our world, okay? The way we think about ourselves, the way we think about our kids, the way we think about what is normal, what we do when we suffer, or our kids struggle with their emotions. We're in a totally different world than it was 50 years ago in our self-conception. But this whole story we have of a biological model of psychiatric disorders has completely changed us as a society, and none of the metrics are good. What percentage of our college kids now seek mental health services during college? you have any idea? Okay, it's more than 50%. More than 25% of kids at, at good schools arrive with a diagnosis and a, 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 a prescription. That's brand new. If you go back to the 1970s, people weren't flocking through the mental health services. Half the colleges didn't even have them. And now we're turning ourselves into a sort of a Inward looking people always looking at what's wrong with us instead of looking at how resilient we can be and looking at kids as like if they struggle that's how they're going to always be. It's ridiculous. It's a new philosophy that produces great profits for the ph pharmaceutical companies but is 
ruining us as a society or, or doing great harm. And by the way, every society that has adopted this paradigm of care has seen the burden of mental illness go way up. This international benzodiazepine symposium is really launching a movement toward the goal of solving this 60-year-old pharmaceutical conundrum. So we're not looking just to do this little symposium so people go home with their goodies and their knowledge. We want each of the people who came to this symposium to become a messenger so that more and more people who have been compromised by these drugs will have a chance to recover. For more information and a vast amount of resources, please join us on advocatesforsocialreform.com. Thank you very much.